All right. Sounds like we're, we're live. Are you guys having a great build? Yeah? Okay, excellent. Uh, hello, I'm Jeff. What's that? Like the tie. Good, thank you. Howdy, I'm Jeffrey Snover. Uh, my talk today is why developers are eating the world. Now, I need to provide some caveats here, right? So this is not a technical building session, you know, technical skill building session. If you came here to learn how to code, this is not the session for you. Uh, I'm not insulted if you decide you have a better uh, use of your time at one of those. Uh, this is also, um, sorry, this is also, these are, this is a Jeffrey talk. This is not a Microsoft talk. This is a Jeffrey Snover talk, right? So this is my, I kind of stepped back and looked at things and said, hey, I think here's what's going on. Now, that's a good, uh, good thing and a bad thing. Here's the thing you should note. I'm a technical fellow, so sort of they pay me to, to do this sort of thing, to take a look. Uh, see what's important, see where the future's going, and uh, be right in important ways a pretty high probability of the time. That's sort of the definition of a technical fellow. And uh, so there's lots of speculation here, lots of forward-looking stu stu uh, forward stuff, um, but I think you will get something out of it. Could be wrong. Your, your evaluations will tell me. But please, I feel for, love negative feedback, but don't give me any feedback that says, I was looking to hear something about JavaScript, the latest .NET framework. That's not this talk. All right, so here's, I'll be concrete about what it is we're gonna discuss, right? I'm gonna discuss software eats the world. What's that about? Um, forging the fabric of the future. You'll see how I believe that we, Developers are forging the fabric of the future, what that means. I'll talk about there's some issues with that. And then I'll talk about, you know, Microsoft's doing a ton of stuff in this space. Uh, give a small set of examples of that. And then get concrete. Okay, how do we address these issues moving forward? Okay, so software eats the world. In 2011, Mark Andreessen wrote an article where he said software eats the world. How many people have, have read that? Okay, uh, there's a link here. It's worth reading. It's a very good document. Basically, what he said was, hey, you remember all that hype around the dot-com, you know, the dot-com before the crash? The reality is the hype was all correct. Okay, the crash was, it was a timing issue. It was an over-expectation uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, when things would happen, but the fundamental assumptions of the dot-com were correct. He pointed out that it's been 60 years since the computer revolution, 40 years since the microprocessor, 20 years since in the internet, and that now these things were combining and being accessible at a global scale. He pointed out how, you know, when he started a company in, in, in 2000, to run an internet application was costing him $1,500 a month, no, sorry, $150,000 a month, and that in 2011 it was now just costing him $1,500 a month. So there was this incredible uh, combination of technology, reach of audience, and precipitous drop in prices. And he said software is eating the world. What the heck does that mean? Well, really he was talking about two things. One is that software is going to eat traditional businesses, right? So ads were being delivered by Google, music being delivered by iTunes, uh, telephony by Skype, things like that. But also for things where the entire business was not being replaced by software, where the business stayed the same, that software represented a greater part of the value chain for a business, okay? So business starts with some raw components, they deliver something to customer. And what he was saying was that software plays a more and more important role of that entire value chain. Cars are the best example, right? Cars. Don't drive a computer, you drive a car. And yet software is controlling the engine, it's controlling the safety systems, it is providing the navigational systems, the in-car uh, entertainment systems, and most importantly, it provides new business opportunities, something that they like to call post-purchase um, monetization opportunities. So even for all these things, right, defense, uh, software-driven, retailers, software-driven, just each of these businesses, more and more their value was being delivered by software. And what he said was that companies in every industry need to assume that there is a software revolution coming, okay? So, this is a list of the top companies in the world 
as measured by market share. Okay? This is the same list where those companies that are fundamentally driven by software are now highlighted. Okay? That is incredible. Right? The majority of the largest companies in the world are primarily software companies. Software is eating the world. Now, this is that list, largest group of companies, when Andreessen wrote his article in 2011. Those highlighted are the software companies. Okay? So, from 2011 to now, that's what's happened. So, software is eating the world. You, as developers, are kind of important. So if your employers are not treating you importantly, make a note of that. There are other people who will. I'm actually very serious about that. Okay, now, here, one of the companies I did not highlight, but was on that list of top companies, was General Electric. Because General Electric is not currently a primarily software company, but they're trying to be. They have a very large digital transformation effort. If you go to their website, you'll see this. Five steps driving digital transformation by GE Digital. And look at this. Who's afraid of big bad Uber? So GE is talking about the competitive threat by Uber. Okay? Here, two other, sorry, so GE's on this list again. Basically, every company becomes a software company. JP Morgan, another on that list of the top biggest companies that I did not highlight. Um, Jamie Dimon said, Silicon Valley is coming. They are coming for him. We're going to work to make our services as seamless and competitive as theirs, right? So Jamie Dimon's not looking at this competitive, traditional competitor saying, oh, maybe Deutsche Bank's going to eat our lunch. Maybe these guys are going to eat lunch. He sees the threat coming from the disruption by software companies, okay? Jeffrey Immelt, another thing. Okay, so none, a number of great quotes here, but the point to make is that software is eating the world. Software is changing the world. Whether you're a pure software play or you're another play, software is eating the world. By the way, I'm just going to take a step here aside because we're all, how, you're all developers? Happy days? <clears throat> I used to work at companies where we did software, but software was not our primary business, okay? So I worked for storage technology. We used to make manufactured disk drives. I worked for Digital Equipment Corp, or Apollo Computers. We made workstations. Uh, I worked for Digital Equipment Corporation, made mini computers and, and, and microcomputers. Then I switched and I worked for Tivoli, a pure software company. And from Tivoli, I went to Microsoft. Again, pure, largely software company. And I will tell you how I was treated was completely different working in a company where software was a thing from software is the thing, okay? If you are a manager of a company where software isn't the thing, but a thing, you need to be treating your people as though it is a, your developers, as though software is the thing. The culture's different, the compensation's different, et cetera. So if you're in this industry where, again, software is not the thing, guess what? You are in the software business. You are in the software business. Microsoft, is a competitor for your talent. You better be treating your talent very, very well, your software talent very, very well. Now, talk about forging the fabric of the future. So that's all pretty exciting stuff, right? Ray Kurzweil has this model he calls the, the law of accelerating returns. It's what we all know, and that is that technology grows upon itself. Okay? It grows uh, uh, exponentially. That is a logarithmic scale. And what it shows here is um, calculations per second per $1,000. Okay? And what he's saying is, and that's a logarithmic scale, and look what's happening, right? It, that it just continues to accelerate. Now, we're here, and so that gets us about one mouse brain. So for about $1,000, you can get one mouse brain's worth of computing. And uh, Andreessen had said, hey, it had been 40 years since the microprocessor. So I thought, well, okay, 40 years, that's a pretty interesting uh, uh, statement. And a number of us will be in the industry for 40 years. So let's see where that brings us to. So this is sort of where we are at 40 years. 
And so what that is saying is, if Kurzweil's right, and he is, um, around, you know, 40 years from now, for $1,000, we're going to be able to do and purchase a computer which has the compute capacity of all the current human brains in existence. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Holy shit. That's right. Oops. It's being auto-translated. How does this come out? Anyway. <laughs> You're bad influenced, my friend. Okay, so let's put that in perspective. That's a big deal. Now, where were we going to be in where are we going to be in 40 years? Well, let's talk about where we are today because you know it's important to step back, right? We are all so busy with this problem and that problem and the, the home, pro you know, etc. You need to stop and look at where we are and then think about where we're going. Because where we are is pretty freaking incredible right now. Azure, Azure is planetary scale compute infrastructure that you can buy and stop using. You can buy VMs in Asia. You can buy VMs in Europe. You can buy VMs in Africa. Just boom, go and get it. Like, and then it's available to you in minutes. That's crazy stuff, right? There are over 2.5 billion cell phones today. That's 2.5 billion people that, okay, well, a cell phone, that's a pretty ca capable thing. But the real power of the cell phones, the other end of the cell phone, right? It's going up to the network, right, into the cloud and consuming, you're leveraging hundreds of thousands, millions of cores all delivered to that cell phone. By 2020, we expect over six devices per user. I think that's actually low. I think it'll be high, but maybe on aggregate that's true. So we have smart homes now. Uh, I have one of them. They're not quite smart, but they're getting there. Uh, they are computer controlled, let's call it that way. We definitely have smart grids, and we also have things like smart chemical processing plants. Chemical processing plants. Okay, wait a minute. And what are the trends? Okay, so we see trends like information and education delivery, right? Computers undeniably uh, successful in that area, right? Khan Academy, Pluralsight, um, uh, Lydia.com. Uh, control over more and more of the physical world, okay? Uh, more and more control over biological systems, including real-time biological systems, not just intensive care units. People, talk, Scott Hanselman talks about having a, a glucose monitor uh, that's being run on an open source. It's a little bit scary. Um, so real-time biological control systems, attention management systems, surveillance systems, uh, professional cybercrime, nation cyber attacks. Do you get that list? Here are the trends. I mean, with this incredible capability, like, yay, but look at these things, right? Nation state attacks, cybercrime, surveillance, attention management. Think of where you're going to be with these trends, that escalating technology capability, and then 40 years from now, okay? So, here is the observation. Andreessen was right. Software eats the world. But if software eats the world, where'd that software come from? And the answer is developers, right? Now, what could possibly go wrong? Okay. Now, here's my central thesis, right? The people in this room are the ones that are going to be building, literally, literally building the fabric of the future. All those things, real-time control, biological control, information uh, delivery, learning, et cetera. Literally, you are going to be, you know, the, the fabric of the world in 40 years is going to be running on software developed by this group of people, okay? And so we need to stop and ask ourselves, you know, what kind of world do we want to build? Because left unanswered, we'll just make a set of assumptions and we could build a world that we don't like. So let's talk about that a little. Let's talk about some of these issues that we see here. Give me one second here. Okay. Let's talk about some of the issues. Because the reality is, is that the, these, this, the future prevents, provides both challenges and opportunities. Okay. So we are on the cusp of a technology revolution. Uh, many people have referred to this as the fourth industrial revolution. This revolution is going to change the way we live, the way we work, the way we communicate, the way we learn. 
Now, this is not the first time this has happened. We've had other large changes before, right? Uh, each time, it's been sort of a central uh, set of technolo technology or set of technologies that spurred dramatic and rapid change, and it's about to happen again. So the first industrial revolution was all built around the steam engine. The second industrial revolution was focused in around internal um, uh, combustible engines, combustion engines, and around electricity. The third industrial revolution around microelectronics, microprocessors. And the fourth, the intelligent cloud, intelligent edge, are combining in a way that provide really sort of unprecedented power and are going to bring about this fourth industrial revolution. And with that, there's going to be great change. Now, again, think through this model of the cloud computing, right? We literally have hundreds of data centers. Microsoft itself has over 50. Well, we have 50 regions. In each of those regions, we have multiple data centers. So if you've ever seen those, it was one of the things I don't think we make clear enough. We have this great video showing the, the walk fly through of a data center. That data center is not a region. That data center is a data center. Multiple data centers separated by space uh, form a region, okay? So anyway, we are, there are hundreds, we have 50 regions, many, many, many data centers. Uh, think of the other cloud providers. There's lots of stuff running up in the cloud, okay? Now combined, these data centers have the ability to compute and store just incredible amounts of data, right? Now, the benefit of all this could be enormous, right? We could use this to reduce uh, uh, diseases, we could use it to reduce um, uh, uh, poverty, uh, we could do this to help ma understand and manage climate change, but the reality is is that we're already st starting to see some of these changes and some of these benefits now, but technology disrupts everything. It disrupts it for good and it disrupts it for bad. Right? Most of this we've seen is positive, but the reality is you just can't go a week without watching the news or picking up a paper to see the clouds on the horizon. Okay? So, a few examples. Job displacements, right? Lots of people are very worried about the role of automation in reducing jobs. Okay? Now, if you, we all have different assessments of where we will be with autonomous vehicles, I will tell you this for certain. There are two problems. Uh, this is the job of an architect. An architect's job, I say, is the art of deciding when one thing should be two or two things should be one. Right now, we talk about autonomous vehicles as one thing. We really need to talk about it as two because they are very different problems. One autonomous vehicle is the thing most people talk about. Oh, I'm in a car, I'm on a rural road, blah, 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 I'm a commuter. That's one set of problems. There's another autonomous vehicle problem, and that is long haul trucking. Long haul trucking. Long haul trucking is a dramatically simplified problem. Its benefit, its economic benefit to those who use it is dramatically, is vast compared to your, you just want to put on your makeup while you're, you're driving to, to work, right? Or you want to watch a DVD while you're going to work. There's no economic value there. But long haul trucking, there's incredible value. When you put something in Boston, on a truck in Boston, that trucker can only drive eight hours a day. Now, then when he stops, he's got to stop for the rest of the day before he picks it up and goes, there's all your capital sitting on the side of the road. That's capital not being productive. If you're a finance guy, they talk at all about earns and turns. Earns. I invest a dollar. How much do I get back? A dollar fifty. Fifty cents. Great. Turns. How often do I do that? If I spend a dollar and get a dollar fifty back once a year, that's one turn. If I spend a dollar and get a dollar fifty back once a week, that's fifty turns, fifty-two turns in a in a year. That's much better. So if you have capital on the side of the road, you have low turns. You want to be capital productive. So long haul trucking is going to be successful in, I think, relatively short order. We'll see where. But it is going to have a devastating effect to the millions of long haul truckers 
There are literally millions of them. It is a job most Americans um, uh, from a wide variety of backgrounds can do, and it is a very good paying job. In addition, those people stop off at these truck stops. They are the engines of the rural economy. Okay? It is going to have substantial effects. Also, the question around community safety. Hey, when, do we, when are we transparent and we share information with the government? When is that a good thing? We've seen examples where people want that, and then we've seen examples where governments take that and use it for things we're not comfortable with. Income inequality. Is the benefit of the cloud going to include an ever-decreasing set of billionaires while the rest of the people are not? Uh, or is it going to be are the benefits of the cloud going to be shared uh, amongst everyone? And then access, right? The reality is, is that today over 4 billion people, over 60% of the world's population, are not benefiting from the power of digital transformation. Now here's four examples, but again, you just cannot go a week without hearing issues of cyber crime, uh, data privacy issues, uh, real world effects of uh, cyber attacks, uh, et cetera. So let's draw through a couple examples of opportunities and then also challenges. So here is a chart that shows <clears throat> an estimate of what happens when people have steady state AI. Take AI and deploy it. What will that do to the economy? So the smaller bars here, bright pink, is an assumption of the GDP going forward. And here's an assumption of what happens when you have AI at its steady state. You see a dramatic increase in the gross domestic product of countries. Now I will tell you a very small uptick in gross domestic product, like half a percent, is an enormous thing. I never had that in focus, like, oh, why is everybody getting excited by a 1% increase in the GDP? A 1% increase in the GDP is huge. So these numbers <coughs> are just enormous. But there's also challenges, right? <coughs> it can displace jobs. Here, someone had done a, 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 an analysis of those jobs that were uh, um, susceptible to automation, right? So lawyers, not so much, but somewhere in here, paralegals, very high. Legal assistants, okay? Guess what? These guys are already, these people are already making a lot of the money. These folks are the, the folks who are trying to, to go up, you know, rise up the ladder. <clears throat> you can see where this left unaddressed, the rich are going to get richer and the poor are going to get poorer, right? They get automated out of a job, okay? Loan officers. There's a number of things where the task itself lends itself to automation. So there's great disruption here. Now, some people will say, oh, well, for every wave of automation, there's always a wave of new jobs. And that has been true. Um, it's unclear that this will be the case here. And it's unclear that there will be a, a, a mesh a smooth timing between the decrease of jobs and the increase in new jobs. Nobody said that happens at the same time. And if there's a gap, you got social disruption, you have problems. <clears throat> Technology, businesses, and governments have worked together to really make incredible progress on world poverty. So this is the percentage of the population, that's world population, living in poverty, okay? So this goes back quite a ways. I think it's 1820, and look where it is now, right? And then we started mapping. This is people living with w less than $1 a day. I mean, and this, yeah. I mean, it's just made great progress. So happy days, right? Everything's great. Well, now let's take a look at in income inequality. And this is the share of global wealth. Okay, and this is the percentage of global wealth owned by the top 1%. And this is the share owned by everybody else. Okay, that's, that's not quite stable. Here is a list of internet usage. And you just see the access to the internet is exploding. But at the same time, take a look at um, the costs associated with cyber attacks and cyber crime. And I will tell you that that is not, uh, I, I believe that that is not an accurate number. I know that there have been a number of cyber attacks where there have been substantial 
economic harm that people just shut up about. They don't report. They don't want anybody to know. So in fact, I think this is, is even worse. Now, technology revolutions uh, can be disastrous, right? There are these disruptions, right? There's huge societal changes, uh, and there are the growing pains of the new technology, right? Uh, back in the uh, first industrial revolution, uh, the innovators of the age were called mechanical engineers. And these guys moved fast and broke things. Hmm, sound familiar? But when these guys moved fast and broke things, like lots of people died, like lots of people died. And in fact, the, um, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers was formed in response to some of the crises of this new era, where these you know, fast movers uh, were going, you, know, you had a bunch of cowboys, a bunch of charlatans, and there was a crisis. And basically the deal between the mechanical engineering society, mechanical engineers and society, that deal was broken. Right? And it was not going to work. And so society was either going to change it or the mechanical engineers were going to change it. Mechanical engineers took the initiative, formed the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. They set up uh, standards. They set up safety rules. They set up ethics and really brought about a change in that industry to make it a technology that could be accepted and was safe for society to, to do. Now, technology, again, we use it for our business, but it doesn't just change our business. It changes our society, uh, and it changes you know, a, a wide range of things, right? So when it comes to people, it's changing interpersonal relationships, right? It's breaking barriers of nationality, geography, uh, language, uh, communities are forming, uh, NGOs, non-governmental groups, are empowered and enabled by technology um, and in communication. Um, we're also seeing that it's raising issues around the proper role of government. When should government step in? Will regulation kill the golden goose or will it set down the guidelines to enable uh, free competition, et cetera? A lot of people have a knee-jerk reaction to regulation, and there's a lot of reason for that, right? Often, sometimes these people regulate things that they don't understand and, and can have negative effects. But I will tell you that the regulation of standards, weights, and procedures has been a universal good thing. When you tried to sell corn by the bushel, and you tried to sell it by the pound, and you tried to sell it by the glotchet, it's like, what? What does that mean? And now when we say, hey, here's how we sell things, pounds, and this is what a pound is. Then when you say I'm selling it for $2 a pound, and you tell me you're selling it for $10 a pound, I can ask some interesting questions and make informed choices. So sometimes regulation is absolutely not always bad. Sometimes it's, it is, in fact, very good. And privacy. In a world now, like literally, where most everything you do can be tracked and recorded forever, what does that mean in terms of privacy, right? And you'll see in Europe, I think they're a little bit ahead on this, with things like the right to be forgotten and things like the GDPR. So I've recently come across this phrase, and I really like it a lot, you know, basically being woke. Woke. What the hell does that mean? I looked it up. And woke is basically being aware and knowing what's going on in the community. And so when we say developers are eating the world, what I think we want to be is we want to be woke developers are eating the world. We want to wake into these issues, make conscious decisions, because if we don't, bad things will happen. So concretely, look, we're developers, right? We know how to deal with our concerns, right? We know about technology concerns. We look at a problem that we have to solve, and we know to take a look at the technology choices we have and to say, hey, am I got a, have I got the right fit? Right? Am I using the right tool in the right place? Am I doing this as, uh, am I building a lot of undue technical debt? Those are things that are all in our wheelhouse. We got lots of talks about that here. You'll get better at it, et cetera. But I'll also tell you that the folks that are very successful in their companies are the ones that are also able to address these issues, right? Business issues. Hey, this technology, it's great, but is it the right business strategy? Is it going to help, uh, you know, th the way I think of it is you have to benefit the customers and that benefits the company and then it benefits you. If you're just focused in on technology and you're not thinking about the customers and the business, 
you're one type of developer. If you're a type of developer who's focused in on the technology and making sure that that technology drives the business and makes your customers successful, you are a much more valuable developer. But what I'm saying is that going forward, we need to incorporate this. And that is to step back and say, hey, what are the societal implications to our technology choices, right? So is this legal? Is it ethical? Um, where, are there users that are being excluded? Um, and does this improve the lives of our users? So disability, you know, we now have, there's some laws around developing software to help and enable people with disabilities. And in the past, we used to think about disabilities as a health condition. But really, that model of thinking is, is going away. And I make the point that uh, addressing these accessibility issues is good. It is good for our society. It is good for those less fortunate than ourselves. And it is good for our business. And that's this enhanced understanding of disability. Because disability is sometimes a health condition. For example, with touch, you know, somebody might not have all their limbs. But it's also situational, right? A temporary, sorry, tempor a temporal issue, right? Someone might have a broken arm and they can only use one arm. That's, there are more of those people than people who have lost an arm. But then there's also situational, right? A new parent or someone holding a baby or carrying something in one arm. They only have access to one arm, okay? Those, the solution you provide for one helps enable the other scenarios as well. Sight, the same thing. There are blind people, but then there are people with cataracts, right? There's this thing called the American baby boom, right? Those baby boomers, guess what? They're getting old. Guess what? When you get old, your eyes go to, sh go to hell. <laughs> A bunch of those people are going to have cataracts. Here's the question. Do you want them to not be your customer, or do you want them to still deliver, get benefit from your products, and you get the monetization from their usage? You got to pay attention to those people because there's a whole wave of them coming. But then think through distracted drivers, right? You don't want the customer, if, you, if, if your user interface requires someone to be looking at it, that means it can't be used by a driver, okay? So you want to think through, hey, how can I deliver my value in a way that helps blind people, help people with cataracts, and increase, help with distracted drivers? So again, I want to nail this point. Taking, addressing your software, accommod to accommodating your software to the needs of um, people with varied abilities is not only the right thing to do, it is the right thing to do for your business. And software really is too important to forget about ethics. And this is that point I was trying to make before. If as a profession, we don't clean up our act and get our act together, uh, we will get controlled. Just as the, the deal the mechanical engineers had with society was broken when their practices, et cetera, led to explosions and death, and it was a choice. They were either going to regulate themselves or they're going to be regulated externally. I think the same thing happens is going to happen to us, right? Cyber attacks, attacks against the, the power grid. Hello, McFly, think about this stuff. This is important stuff. Software controlled chemical processing plants. You know, we got to have, we got to do a better job, my friends. So as you do this, you think through some of these issues, right? When in doubt, you just focus your solutions that amplify human dignity. And that sounds kind of fluffy, kind of light and airy, uh, but in fact, it's actually a really good thing. At Digital, I used to work for Digital, I mentioned that earlier, and at Digital, we had a culture, and it was summed up a, a single phrase, do the right thing. And I remember joining Digital, and I was like, what the heck are you talking about, do the right thing? How's that actionable? How does that tell me whether I should do this or that and that? And the answer was, do the right thing. And the genius of Ken Olson was he understood that within each of us, we have an innate moral sense. And we're not stupid, right? We know that there's a business here and a customer that needs to be satisfied. And he trusted each of us as individuals to say, hey, when you are in a dilemma, do the right thing. That we would figure it out and we would do the right thing. 
And sometimes you got that right, and sometimes you get educated about other factors to go into your calculation of doing it right. But it worked incredibly well, and if you search the history of Digital Equipment Corporation, you'll find that it was one of the most progressive and morally ethical companies we've really ever had. Just fantastic leadership there. But the point is, you don't need to be overly complicated. You don't need a detailed spec. Under these conditions, um, don't run over the person. Under these conditions, run them over. You don't need that. Do the right thing, right? When in doubt, amplify. Use this, pick the solution that amplifies human dignity. Lots, I'm going to drill in. There are lots of aspects here that I've talked about, security, privacy, et cetera. AI has on fire, right? If you haven't, if you have not up on current news, AI is on fire. There's an incredible amount of optimism around AI. Let me show you a, a tape, and by the way, I share this. It, it is incredibly cool stuff. Innovation is not just a word; it's an action. With artificial intelligence, we are not crawling or walking or running. We are flying today. Microsoft AI helps an architect bring history back to life. He doesn't see data. He sees fragments of our past. This is now. Artificial intelligence helps farmers grow more food with less resources. She's not collecting information. She's feeding a growing population without wrecking the planet. This is real. An engineer explores how AI could help the deaf see sound. She's not looking at obstacles. She's staring down opportunity. Innovation doesn't see the possibility of tomorrow. It creates tomorrow. And are you ready for the headline? Tomorrow is here today. Yeah. Very exciting stuff. Let me just make sure. Yeah. Give enough for time and resources. I'll figure this out. Great. So there's um, indeed, you know, what do you talk about? AI for uh, cultural, advancing culture, advancing um, crops, feeding people, reducing planetary impact, uh, AI to uh, provide value to, and functions to a wider range of people. All these things are true. It's very impressive stuff. It's very important stuff. And the very same technology is killing people. Like, not maybe, not theoretically, like literally killing people, okay? You know, AI, you just see a suite of challenges, right? Whether it was the Google image recognition, which identified African Americans as gorillas, oh my lord, uh, to um, gender biases. Um, Microsoft, Microsoft had an experiment in AI, a chatbot. Within hours, this thing was a racist, fascist, Nazi, horrible, like the worst of humanity uh, out there on the internet. It was just a disaster, okay? Um, so AI, incredibly, uh, incredibly uh, powerful, but also um, problematic. And here's the thing you should understand. When I discussed Digital Equipment Corporation, what I said was that Ken Olson understood and believed in the innate moral compass of each individual. Okay? And the reality is, is that each of us as humans have both an internal innate moral compass and a learned moral compass. Okay? Different societies have different morals associated with certain areas, but there are some universals. Now, it turns out that I said most humans have an innate moral compass. Not all. Not everyone does. There's a class, a group of people that have no social empathy. And there's a word for such people, and they're called psychopaths, okay? They're psychopaths. They have no moral empathy. Now, not all psychopaths are bad. That's a strange statement, but work with me. It's true. Not all psychopaths are bad. Some psychopaths are. We hear about them all the time. But in some circumstances, psych psychopathy is actually a benefit. Think through the scenario of childhood oncology, okay? Uh, if you had a person in that job with very high social uh, empathy, 
um, the tragedy of that field would crush them very, very quickly. A certain level of psychopathy helps with those people who can just take a look at the situation, look at the you know things, and prescribe a set of fact without being overly involved and overly letting their emotions overcome them. So psychopathy has its benefits. And here's the thing you need to understand: artificial intelligence is psychopathic. There is no innate moral compass to artificial intelligence. It is only the things that we teach it, okay? So that's why training is so important. In fact, I, whenever you hear the term artificial intelligence, I want you to think psychopathic intelligence. And again, psychopathy is not always bad. It's often very, very good. Uh, but there's a set of things that you'll want it to do, and there's a set of things you won't want it to do, and rarely will you want to turn your back on it, okay? So you got to walk into this with your eyes wide open. Artificial intelligence is psychopathic intelligence. We see this a lot when it comes to AI and bias. Okay? Now, how many people here have participated in an unconscious bias training? Oh, wow, that's good. I encourage you to do it. We are forced to do that at Microsoft, and when I saw that on my calendar, I was like, oh, Man, I am so busy. Why am I, why are they sending me to this? I went to that and it was like, oh, wow. It was very enlightening. There and we have a great blog on this here. There's a link here to talk about the different types of bias, right? The data set bias, right? So, why did that Uber car run down a person? It turns out that that model had not been trained against bicycles and that the sensors that they use Basically, the spokes of a, of a, of a wheel uh, look like noise to those sensors. So it was trained against data that didn't see that. Okay, well, that's the current hypothesis. But depending upon what you fuel that engine and, and teach it, that's the only things that it's gonna learn. And so that's why a bunch of facial recognition stuff works great for people like me, white American, North Americans, right? Um, people of different ethnicities, you'll see the error rates start to, to increase, right? And it's a function of what data did you feed it, okay? There are association biases. Um, geez, I feed it this data, and lo and behold, uh, all the doctors are men and all the nurses are women, right? AI doesn't know anything. It knows nothing. They're just gonna say, oh, you fed me this data, therefore, you know, a woman doctor that does not compute. So there's all sorts of intrinsic biases here. This is a real problem, and I encourage you to get educated on it. Now, AI will cause harm. It will cause harm, full stop. We've already seen it, right? Car runs over a person, kills them. There are a lot of problems here. First is the technology is new, it's growing. It's growing all the time, but it is in its childhood. The second is there are amoral applications. Now, by the way, let me step back on this model. So think this through this, right? You got, two, you got a lot of flavors of AI, but in terms of machine learning, how does that work? The answer is somebody produces a machine learning engine. That done? No. It's continually updated. Okay, so that AI engine's continually updated. Then somebody takes data, cases, and they teach the AI engine. Okay, so of the entirety of the world, you take a subset of that and you feed it to this engine. It somehow learns something. I will tell you this, you cannot tell what it's learning, full stop. You just can't, you can't. Then someone's gonna take a new case, present it to this engine, and a decision will be made. And someone's gonna get killed. Now, who's to blame? Who's to blame? And I will tell you that it is pretty close to, people will ver differ on this point, it'll be either virtually impossible or metaphysically impossible. I'm on the metaphysically impossible page. I believe that it will be metaphysically impossible to, uh, uh, to ascribe blame to that effect because the engine is continually updating. We don't really know the process by which this engine takes this data and forms a model. I mean, as crazy as that sounds, it is true. We do not know how this works. And then when we match it, we don't really know what it is about that new data that made it make a decision. You will not be able to know, and somebody's gonna get hurt. 
And the challenge with this is that, that if we don't get ahead of this, um, the societal backlash could hurt everyone. Now, someone will say, oh, an autonomous car killed somebody. We can't have autonomous cars killing people. Well, yeah, that's true, bad thing. On the other hand, I truly believe that when we get this technology worked out, the number of people killed by autonomous cars will be dramatically lower than the number of people killed by cars driven by you people, right? You're distracted, you're looking at your phone, the kids are yelling at you, you're thinking about that review you just had or the bad uh, fight you had with your spouse, um, it's dark, etc. People kill a lot of people driving cars. And I believe that with autonomous cars, there'll be fewer people that are die. They will die, but there'll be fewer. And so the point is that, well, if society looks at this and says, wait a second, you just built an autonomous car and you killed this person. Why? And we say, dude, it's technology. You don't know. That is not going to work. Right? They're going to say, what the hell? What? Are you serious? And they're going to shut that down. And as a result, if that happens, more people will die. So we need a better answer. And these are hard problems. By the way, here's the net of it. I'm drilling in. The net of it is we as a group need to think about these hard problems and address them. And the, the good thing is that we've got some prior art. And in particular, there's things like the Underwriters Lab and the Vaccine Court. And I think that these provide very good models. Okay? Now, just as I had mentioned the Society for American um, uh, Mechanical Engineers, there was a, 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 an electrical engineer who went to the Chicago World's Fair, and what he saw there uh, horrified him. So basically, he was there to inspect uh, electrical systems to prevent fires, right? It's one of the largest attended events in the world, uh, even to this day it was, uh, and a fire could be devastating. So he got in there, and what he realized was that they were at the same Error, they were about to have the same problems that the mechanical engineers had. And so he set up underwriters laboratories. So underwriters laboratories established, they are effectively in the trust engineering business. The trust engineering business, okay? So what does it say? Underwriters labs helps companies, helps companies demonstrate safety, confirm compliance, enhance stability, manage transparency, deliver quality and performance, strengthen security, protect brand reputation, build workplace excellence, and advance society well-being. So Underwriters Laboratory establishes these standards, ethical and electrical, that everything you buy has, right? You cannot buy something in America that has not been UL certified, right? How many people go to the store, electronic store, see something very attractive, and then pause and say, I wonder if I buy that, whether it's going to kill me, right? Anybody do that? No. And the reason why you don't do that is because of Underwriters Laboratory. Under, you cannot sell these things unless they go through this testing, right? And they have these standards for how you design circuits to be safe, to be transparent, etc. They have engineered trust into the system, okay? Um, we have no such practices in software engineering, we have no such standards in AI. We will. There is something called the Vaccine Court. In fact, its proper name is the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act. Here's what happened. In the 18, sorry, the 1980s, there were a number of people who vaccinated their children they believed their children were harmed by, by these vaccines and they sued the vaccine makers and they won. The vaccine makers had huge awards uh, 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 fined to them. They did what a business would do. They decided we're not gonna build vaccines anymore. This is an unprofitable business, we're out. All but one vaccine manufacturer stop building vaccines, stop creating vaccines. Congress looked at this and viewed it as a national security threat. Without vaccines, you threatened the herd immunity of the population and it was, opens us up to a devastating effects. So Congress acted and Congress created this act. And what it did was they set up a no-fault system for litigating vaccine injuries. Now, if you 
vaccinate your child and there's some harm and you want to sue, you may not sue the maker of that vaccine. You take your claim to the vaccine court. The vaccine court has a different burden of proof. It is very favorably disposed to the plaintiffs, okay? But it is a different standard of proof specifically designed in this area. And then when they have awards, they are well-defined awards, not unlimited awards, okay? So they're very friendly to the plaintiffs. Uh, and then the costs of the, the awards are paid out of a fund, which is uh, out of a, yeah, funds, which are collected on each vaccine. So here's an example where society said, we believe the science all indicates that um, vaccines are unambiguously good, they're unambiguously beneficial to society, and yet we also know that people's biology we don't really un fully understand, and that there could be cases where something that is you know, almost universally beneficial to everyone, 99.999, pick your number of nines, um, beneficial to everyone, in the edge cases could harm someone. So we are just gonna say, we are gonna have a system for dealing with that. We're gonna manage that risk in a way that takes care of them, but allows progress to continue forward. And that's why we have a healthy vaccine uh, world today. So I believe something like this needs to happen for artificial intelligence, right? Where we say, as a society, autonomous cars, we know people are gonna get killed by autonomous cars. If you build an autonomous car, according to these set of principles, according to these safety standards, et cetera, um, then there should be a compensation program to deal with those cases. Because otherwise, a death could lead to you know, astronomical um, uh, payouts which could dampen progress. Dampening progress could then kill more people by having more people still drive their cars. So what is Microsoft doing? Microsoft is doing an incredible amount in this area. It's one of the things I like the most about Microsoft. We've got a president, Brad Smith, who's incredibly active in this stuff. Uh, and just doing a great job. I think you meant, heard Satya today mention that when it came to that uh, protecting, you know, balancing the governmental right to information or demand for information against our customers' privacy, uh, we have sued the U.S. government four times and gone to the Supreme Court on one of those cases to protect, um, protect our users. Marcus is very active in this. I'm going to talk about just a couple examples. This was our original mission statement, right? Look at that, that suave guy there. Our mission was a computer on every desk and in every home running Microsoft software. There are two things I want you to note here. First is it's focused in on what? Technology. And then who? Us. This is our new mission statement. To empower every person in every organization on the planet to achieve more. Notice that this is focusing in on advancing the achievements of people and their businesses. It's a very different company, very different mission. As we pursue the cloud, we're trying to pursue, we have a, a wide range of initiatives to make sure that this cloud, which again is building the fabric of the future, is a trusted, responsible, an inclusive cloud, right? So I mentioned to you the, the lawsuits that we have, protecting our users' information, um, responsible cloud, we go out of our way to use clean energy and be carbon neutral as much as possible, um, and amplifying human ingenuity through uh, artificial intelligence. We have a different point of view on artificial intelligence from our competitors. Uh, we're very clear on that. And then in terms of an inclusive cloud, uh, we focus in on things like um, you know, making sure that it's useful for people with disabilities. And, sorry, and, and that it is affordable and ubiquitous broadband access. Now that's one of the areas I wanna drill in on. Today, 34 million Americans don't have access to broadband. 34 million, American, million Americans don't have access to broadband. Most of those are in rural communities. Okay? This is a map of broadband access. 
look, American political system is seen, uh, there's a lot of turmoil in our system. A lot of it comes because people in what are referred to as the flyover states are not fully participating in the, belt, the benefits of our digital society, okay? And they feel that and they aren't. So Microsoft has a clear goal to try and help with this. We want to close the rural broad, broadband gap within five years. So let me show you a video of this Microsoft Rural Airband Initiative. Just because you live in a rural area doesn't mean you shouldn't have the opportunity to be connected. That was about, I'd say, ninth grade year is when I began taking college classes through dual enrollment. And that requires that you upload papers and assignments to the college as well as to the high school. I was like, the internet was terrible at home, so I would have to do my assignments really early, like a whole month early. He had to submit a lot of his paperwork, it's just gonna sit there and just spin and spin and spin. You know that the deadline's coming and you know you need more research, and you know it's not enough, it's a struggle. In the beginning of the semester, one of the questions I asked the students, uh, uh, just a show of hands, who, uh, who has internet access? And typically, uh, just a, a few. Right there, that, that tells me that I have to be a little limited in any kind of homework assignment I give. It's a handicap for teachers in, in the 21st century. I mean, here we are, hands are kind of tied. The homework gap is a major problem for our region. And the exciting part is that Charlotte and Halifax County, our two pilot areas, are no longer going to be left behind in this digital divide. TV white space is a new technology that the FCC has allowed vendors to transmit broadband connections wirelessly over previously unused airwaves. Rural markets specifically, it is critical to have access to that lower band spectrum that allows internet providers to serve that last mile affordably. The goal is by fall to have about 250 connected and we're hoping to have 1,000 families connected soon after that. It's gonna open the doors to economic development and allow the people in our area to have access to a world-class education. It was a dramatic increase in productiveness and efficiency. Dylan has a small antenna uh, at his home, which is connected to a TV white space device, turns on his laptop, connects via Wi-Fi. I don't know the tech side. All I know is it works. <laughs> Now that I have TV white space internet, I can use the cloud, and my grade actually shot up going forward with TV white space. I got high Bs and A's. This is where I grew up and I love it. I'm a country girl. Just train our kids so they can stay home and have that knowledge, and then they can bring it back here so that our community can grow. TV white space held up very well with my college application. Once I graduate, I'll be going to attend Old Dominion University in the fall studying computer science, and I'm very excited to go. Yes, yeah, so that's our Air Airband initiative. I, I'm really quite, I like that. So this is all great stuff. At the end of the day, you know, you go to these conferences and you hear about digital transformation and all this wonderful stuff. And I don't know about you, but often you get back and you're like, oh, but what do I do with that? So I'm gonna try and now trans tr change gears and get very concrete. How do we take this stuff? How do we move forward? And the first is to acknowledge, right? Acknowledge that we have an evolving dilemma. Notice I did not say the word problem. These are not problems, these are dilemmas. Problems are things that can be solved. These are not things that can be solved. These things are dilemmas. Dilemmas must be managed. They must be managed on an ongoing basis. 
Okay. We got to be recognized that we are responsible for our moral acts of ourselves and of our products. And we want to shift our focus from this, this bad, bad, bad idea of like, the only thing we can do is to maximize shareholder value. That is wrong. Some people believe that that is in fact a legal requirement. That is absolutely wrong. This is one of the most uh, destructive thoughts that's uh, uh, infiltrated our society, that our only goal is to maximize shareholder value. It's wrong, wrong, wrong. We have stakeholders and we are stakeholders in our society. And if we don't recognize that responsibility, society will change the deal for us. Got to lean in, right? Educate yourself on these issues. There's a ton of them. And then participate, whether it's in the industry, whether it's social or political process. I believe that there will be regulations required in with the, between now and the next 40 years. There's no doubt about that. Uh, if people like you are not involved in that process, that could be bad regulations, right? So you want to be involved in that. And then engineer. Guess what? We are engineers. So how do we solve this problem? we use our engineering skills, right? So number one is it's not a problem, it's a dilemma. That means you incrementally improve yourself, your team, and your products, right? Don't, it's not just one thing. You gotta do this incrementally. And then two is you build systems that find and address problems. Now, Robert Gates, De Defense Secretary Gates, worked under George Bush. When Obama came in, he said, you're a rock star, I want you to continue on in my administration. When he did that, all the cabinet secretaries got together and they're all, oh, this is great, this is great, we're secretaries of the cabinet, all this. And they asked Robert, he said, hey, what advice would you give to us? And he told them this, he said, recognize that at, any, at, at, at this very moment, you are, have people in your uh, environment, in your, uh, in, in your departments that are doing something that's illegal improper or if you found out about it would just piss you off and he said don't have any drama around this don't hide it don't be embarrassed what you need to do is to have mechanisms to find those people and manage them before they can do much harm that's engineering right that's engineering don't hide the problem don't pretend it doesn't there don't sweep it under the rugs have a system find the problem fix the problem. So, guess what? There's a model for this. It's called DevOps, right? In the past, right, software, no, seriously, in the past, software development was really this sort of semi-organizational, semi-organized craftsmanship that somehow got out the door. And what DevOps is doing is it's really transforming that, right? And so in the past, we had a group of developers. They'd focus in on developing, testing, maintaining code and then they toss it over this wall to the operations people who would then be responsible for trying to deploy it, keep it up and running, et cetera. And this tossing stuff over the wall where each group thought that they were rock stars and that other team were a bunch of losers was the problem, right? And so I call that the chasm of despair. It's not a wall, it's a chasm of despair. This is bad, bad, bad stuff, right? And so what DevOps does, do you see what I did there? Took the blue and the red and made it purple. Here you got merge teams, right? Merge teams with joint responsibility doing all of these things together. Now, great stuff. We got lots of talks about DevOps, but here's one I want to get to. The whole point about DevOps is, in this context, is the transformation from a semi-organized craftsmanship into a process, right? My joke is, you, anybody been to a DevOps conference? Okay, so you know, you go to a DevOps conference and there's some inordinate amount of time with people arguing about what DevOps is and what DevOps isn't, right? Those conversations go nowhere, trust me. Um, but in my mind, DevOps is really only two things. It is one, do your work in small batches more frequently so you can learn. And number two, stop being a jerk to your coworkers. That's really all it is. I'm serious. Now, this do work in small batches more frequently. There's a theory behind it. And Sam Guckenheimer calls this the law of the thirds. And that is, the job here is to th listen to the customers, have a hypothesis about what's gonna move the needle, or have some measurement, customer value, ethics, 
inclusion, whatever. Have some measurement, have a hypothesis for how to improve that measurement, act upon that, remeasure. If that, one of three things is going to be the case. Your measurement got improved, your measurement got worse, or it didn't change. If it improved, happy days, beer all around. If it got worse, back that thing out. Now again, if you back it out, that's one of the processes. Uh, you don't want to have invested three years. You want to invest you know, three days to back it out. And if it uh, doesn't make any change, do whatever. And then what you do is you do it again and again and again and again and again. Right? So this is process engineering. Okay? Now, that is literally the task. This is how we take these big, airy ideas and turn it into deliverables. And it's process engineering. I used to be, my start of my career as a process engineer at storage technology, building disk drives. Here's how you do it. You, have a def, ref, you define a repeatable set of steps and you measure the outcomes of those steps. You don't just say, hey, everybody, let's build some disk drives. Like, no, you take this part and you do this to it and you give it to him, you do this to it, you do, okay, you have to find those. Then you make those steps smaller and you do them faster. You automate as many of these steps as you can and then you modify the steps. You modify the steps to optimize the outcomes. So you make a modification and then you see if it happened, if it improved things, and if it did, keep doing it. If it didn't, undo it. But then, as new problems occur, you define new measurements, and then you modify, uh, you either produce new or you modify the steps to improve those things. And then what you want to do is, unless you have exactly one product, you want to support this idea of guilds. Guilds are people who are very interested in a topic, security, artificial intelligence, ethics, and then they work together to learn from each other and act as a common resource for all your projects. And then just as if you're a software person, if you work in software, almost assuredly we do, hopefully you do too, have a process by which you have continuous patent reviews. Hey, we've done a bunch of innovation, what things should we be patenting? Well, that same model of uh, can be applied to continuous security reviews, continuous accessibility, ethical, privacy, and social justice reviews. Engineer these things into your processes. Try and determine measurements, try and determine steps, engineer them in. So that is what we do as a collective, but what do I do? What do I do going forward? Whenever you want to change your behavior, it's best to try and do it in this way. It's like, oh, I should do this. No, 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 that doesn't really stick. What sticks is when you can formulate a change that you want in terms of when and then. When some situation rises, then I do this. Just turns out it's easier for you to remember. It's easier for you to act upon. So personally, how do you do this? A series of when-thens. When you design software, then ensure you're thinking about inclusion and diversity. When you're buying products, then pick the vendors that are committed to cybersecurity. Not all are. Not all are. Don't buy people who are not products from people who are not committed to cybersecurity. It will not work and it will not end well. When hanging out with coworkers, talk about these issues. When looking for a job, pick a company aligned with your morals. Take responsibility. And lastly, most importantly, when you're dying, make sure that you've left the world a better place. Right? <laughs> Jeffrey Hembacher is the chief data scientist at Facebook. And when he left, he said, he said that the greatest minds of our generation are spent trying to convince someone to click on an ad for something they don't need. That sucks. <laughs> and so here's the question. On your deathbed, do you want the people around your coffin to be saying, oh, you know, Mary, she got 100,000 people to buy a garden hose they didn't need. <laughs> right? At the end of the day, people will remember you. Make a set of choices that, that, again, leave the world in a better place. So that's it for my talk. Uh, I hope you hope this was a good use of your time. I've got a, a time for a, a few questions, but please use the microphones.
Thanks. I, I appreciate everything you had to say. Um, so my question is uh, actually directly relates to the current Microsoft slogan. So that idea of empowering people to achieve more, my question is who's left to direct what we choose to achieve? Because if we are um, like the DevOps thing, mm -hmm. that is objectively the most efficient and most effective way to consistently produce quality software without bugs in, in a, a predictable time frame. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say anything about what software you're producing. And so if I work for an ad company, that's reason for being is to get people to click on those things that they don't need. DevOps doesn't really seem to address that, and neither does the yep. Microsoft slogan or a lot of the things that... Um, I got it. You were bringing up a fantastic question, because in general, I'll just say, it's a dilemma. In the past, our model was, you answer that. I mean, look, I don't have an opinion on that. You, answer, you, you figure that out. I empower you with tools. You'll see now that that posture is being questioned. A set of Google engineers had a, a uh, petition to management saying, we don't think that we should be participating in this AI project with the defense company. And the details of that we don't know, but they stood up and were very public about this. That's a, hey, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Microsoft, Eric, Eric Horvitz uh, leads a bunch of our AI stuff, uh, recently disclosed that Microsoft had turned down a, very, a, a set of very large business opportunities because we did not, um, we felt that those business opportunities use of our AI technology would not produce a societal good. Details, I don't know, I'm not sure I wanna know, but um, that issue of who answers what should we should be achieving more with in the past, it's just been, that's up to you. And now you see companies having more and more of an opinion about that. Watch that space. I think it's one of those things that, again, uh, will evolve over time. Got time for one more question. I know if I have some biased, but is it, um, in general, software engineers, majority of them have a uh, maybe a little bit exclusive point, point of view on the world, so we should be careful about not designing software only for ourselves if we tweet everything else in this world. I don't know if you mentioned this, anything like that while you're present. Say it again, that the software engineers have a point of view? Um, so I mean that if we had to design in like yeah. a software to eat everything in this world, so we should be also accounted, think about all like creative people or people who are not engineers. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and in fact, it's one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of having software development teams with a wide group of, of uh, people, right? People who are great at AI, people who are great at C Sharp or whatever, but then also people who are, you know, with a humanities background. And my background is, is in physics and uh, philosophy. And guess what? I bring a lot of that to the, to the job. And so I think you want to, as you build your teams, you want to recognize, you know, uh, what is a team? What is a team? The theory of a team is as follows. Theory of a team is a collection of individuals in a structure that allows their strengths to be amplified and their weaknesses compensated for. So it's not a problem that you say, oh, well, I got this, you know, uh, let's say we, we have people who are autistic and they're great programmers, but they have, uh, you know, they have uh, a certain point of view. And it turns out that we had one guy who's a red teamer on a security team, and that was great. He says, you all think of the world this way. I don't view the world that way, and that helps me find vulnerabilities in our software. So what you want to do is you want to compose a team of differently abled people so that, and then figure out when to listen to who uh, for those aspects. Anyway, there's a lot of topics here. I hope this was uh, a useful use of your time, and uh, thank you very much. I hope you have a great build. <laughs>